Hello, my name is Israel Oman, and you're watching Tape with Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're gonna watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk about Doug. Shalom, welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us. With me today, back again this year, as he's with us every year, Dr. Larry Hirsch from Israel. And welcome. Thank you, thank you, Doug. And uh, nice to have you back with us. Uh, Dr. Hirsch lives in Beit El, which is a settlement on the West Bank of Israel and uh, a thriving community. And with... Uh, your visit here to the United States, uh, we see that there is some political uh, changes in Israel as of recent, and uh, maybe some permanent changes. What do you think the outlook right now is for the government and uh, in, in terms of uh, preventing uh, terrorism and uh, bringing about a bit of peace? I think the outlook for, for the government is probably... Uh on the ups uh, upswing, uh, very optimistic, uh, and um, uh, I think things are moving in the right direction. Um, and uh, as far as um, terror, um, I think along with uh, an anticipated change of, of, of government, hopefully, uh, certainly will come uh, a um, an intention to. Uh, to put an end to terror, and uh, hopefully with it, uh, the success of doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, what about your travels? Uh, I know that uh, you had some incidents in past years you mentioned. Your travels from the hospital and home, and your, your wife traveling to teach, your children traveling to school. How, how is the safety of travel from uh, towns in, in Judea and Samaria such as your West Bank town of Beit El into the city, how are things in, in safety wise in that? Well, uh, certainly, travel within the city is, is certainly no problem. Travels from the West Bank into the city can be problematic. And just as a quick story, back in June, I had a daughter get married. And, oh, so. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I was coming from work in Tel Aviv, and uh, my wife and three of the kids, four of the kids, were coming into Yerushalayim. They uh, came in by bus, passed the French Hill uh, intersection, uh, got off a bus one block later, went down a few steps and caught a second bus into the city. And uh, as they were on the second bus for about three blocks, a uh, suicide uh, bomber blew himself up at the French Hill intersection. They didn't hear a thing, but they missed that by, like I say, about three or four minutes. So certainly um, the travel within Yudav Shomron has certainly become more hazardous. I've been living there 10 years now, and there's no comparison between uh, the trips that I used to take in 92 and the trips that we take now. I mean, they're, they're certainly, um, it's, it's more of a gamble. It always has been a little nerve-wracking. There's no question about that. People, when we get together and talk about it, have always said, oh, every time, uh, and this is conversations from years ago, four or five years ago, every time an error passes me on the road, I cringe waiting for the bullets to start flying. And those are veterans from 20, who've been living there 20 years, and I've only been there about 10 years. Um, there's no question that it's a uh, more nerve-wracking and certainly more dangerous, although um, the buses are all bulletproofed. Uh, certainly people's individual cars, 99 plus percent are not. A few individuals do have that. Uh, doctors are driven out to, to different Yishuvim from the city. The Kupot Folims, the HMOs, they have bulletproof cars bring people out. But by and large, people are traveling despite. Um, certainly one of, uh, one, one of Israel's leading radio personalities from the right, Adir Zik, uh, put up on the uh, mountaintop uh, between Betel and Kochav Yaakov, which now is one of the, 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 the most rapidly expanded community with a large, two large Haredi communities. Shas and other Haredim and uh, Ultra Orthodox, ultra -orthodox uh, a small section right now built uh, by uh, more modern Orthodox in the name of uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Kfar Moshe, I believe it's called, uh, Rav Moshe Tendler, who's uh, from Yeshiva University, uh, is, involved, um, is involved with that. 
and, um, and, 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 and it's, it's a rapidly growing area, and yet he set up on the hillside a bunch of metal five-foot yellow ducks to signify were just a bunch of sitting ducks. Those ducks had been on that hillside since October of two years ago when the present problem started. It's nerve-wracking. The length of the trip, I, it takes me 20 minutes and I'm inside Yerushalayim already, Nebe Yaakov and Piskat Sev. Um, you don't think about it, but uh, times if, when you do, it's a, it's a nerve-wracking... Uh, sure. Sure. And as of recent, uh, when we're taping, uh, the first of my close friends from Chicago to lose a, a relative, uh, Ari Weiss of Blessed Memory, the son of uh, Rabbi Stewart and Susie Weiss, who moved from, as of their most recent residence in, in, in the States, from Buffalo Grove, where he was rabbi, moved in 92 uh, to Israel, and their son was killed uh, in, in his uh, endeavors to uh, be defending the country for the Israel Defense Forces. Very sad. Um, in 92, when we were in Israel, and, and we stayed with you, and you were living in Yerushalayim and Jerusalem, uh, you know, it, it's a comfy situation living in Jerusalem compared to, I'm sure, living in the West Bank. Do you think if you knew things were going to be the way they are now, would you have moved to Beit El? Do you think you would have stayed in Jerusalem? Uh, all right. Um, I'll answer the question, but I'll answer it by, by, by talking about Stuart Weiss. Stuart and I were, were together at the Yeshiva, sat with Rep. Herzl Kaplan in the, in the same shir of Yoridea. He and I and his, his family, my family, were out together at Camp Mosheva up in Wisconsin during the summers. I certainly knew Ari. Uh, uh, years later, Ari went to the high school in Beidel. My wife was teaching English at the time. Later, was only a tester for the baccalaureate Bagrut test. She runs into a kid, and he starts telling her he's from Chicago. As she's testing him, and she realizes who this kid was. She goes, did you once uh, run a golf cart over uh, the uh, camp director as a six-year-old? As a, over the camp director's uh, foot, and he says, "Oh yeah, that was me." When, when, and and his father, Stuart Weiss, Rabbi Stuart Weiss, wrote a, a column in in the Jerusalem Post and is quoted in Herzl Kaplan, who who had said who was anti the Vietnam War, saying that yes, all it's done is taught Americans, young Americans, to view Southeast Asians as just gooks, target practice. And what he was saying was that despite all the political considerations, and there certainly were political considerations, domino effect were stopping the rise of communism, the Chinese, the Russians were putting a barrier. Despite all that, the, fa the moral factor took over. And what's happened in Israel, no question, despite any political considerations, and certainly, again, there are many, the Iraq possible war, the war on terrorism, the Bush, the State Department, and Europe and the EU. Despite all that, the, the cons major, major consideration should be the moral consideration. Jews are being killed here, and it doesn't seem to bother, and it didn't seem to bother enough. None of the governments, certainly in the last two years, which is Barack and Sharon, none of the governments, enough beforehand to say, Oslo is dead, we're putting an end to it. This does not work. The level of security, 67 to 92, when we were in control and the Arabs were disarmed and there was no PLO in this area, the level of security, 67 to 92, was vastly better to, and to be preferred over what we've had 92 to now. So, had I known this was going to happen, and we were building the house, uh, over the period from before Robin was elected, Robin was elected, we finished it up and moved in. Um, my next door neighbor back in Jerusalem is a 57 year, was a 57-year-old Iraqi Sephardi who banged on the door the morning that Robin won and said, you still have your American passport? Get out, get out, get out while you can because they're going to destroy um, the country. I think that Israelis have gotten the message that this is a bungled philosophy of, of peace this isn't the way it can be done, and we had it better. And um, yes, I would have moved anyways. Um, very, good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Tell me, you know, we're talking about uh, what is happening in Israel and uh, the terrorism and the, the the fear and and the hope. Where where? Let's take a step beyond and tell me 
where is the hope? What is the optimism for Israel? Where is the uh, silver lining to everything that we read in the newspaper and see on the news? Because we certainly don't see the good stuff on the news and in the paper. Um, that doesn't trickle down to us so much. And uh, tell me, where, where are we going for, for the good and for the future? Yeah, and, and, and it's very true. It doesn't show up in the headlines here. The headlines here, you're, you're only going to get a very sifted uh, uh, view. It has to be edited because they can't give everything. But if you're living in Israel, then all of a sudden you see all the things that are happening which give a lot of room for optimism. For example, just this uh, last spring, Yom Yerushalayim. Here you had a parade of tens of thousands of people down the main streets of Yerushalayim, down Kiran Ayuso, down King George, up Rehov Yafo, all the way into the old city, and they're marching past Sabaru and Fishman and Bai. Sabaru is the pizza store that was blasted in August of 2001. Was that the 35th anniversary of Jerusalem, Jerusalem Day? Um, that would have been 35. That's right. And, um, and, here, and here Sabaru is all rebuilt. Fishman and Bai, which is a shoe store. I'm wearing their shoes down there, which you can't see. Um, is, or actually their Sandalim, um, is all rebuilt. And, and it gives tremendous feeling of optimism to see, you know, the kippot through gold, the regular people, no kippah, charedim were there, the breast lovers were dancing in the streets with their, their usual uh, dancing sh and singing shtick. Um, so, you know, it gives a tremendous feeling that Am Yisrael Chai, that uh, everything, it doesn't matter. If they, they can blow it up, it's going to be rebuilt. They, they'll never beat us. Uh, and there was other, I have some videotape which I wanted to show, two other events which I think also give a, give, characterize what I think uh, shows a tremendous optimism. One is a new sort of amusement park, but not with rides, an amusement park which is a sort of celebration of the land of Israel and the love of the land of Israel. And the second one, which is the formation of a new settlement, and that over the last recent years usually means a bad thing because everybody uh, somehow takes away or, 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 or takes it for granted that we don't have a right to live in our own country. And here's a settlement that was formed within uh, pre-Six-Day pre pre War Israel in the Negev. And um, the story of this settlement is, is, shows something very vital and alive about the country and uh, gives room for a big optimism. So... In the 35 years since the Six-Day War and the reunification of Jerusalem, uh, there seems to be a, a resurgence today, in, 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 in this year, in this era of what's going on in Israel, of, of patriotism, of uh, love of the land. I, tell us first about the first place you told us about this, this amusement area, this, this uh, display, this... Uh, I don't know how to describe it, this park that people come to visit. What is it all about? Okay. Um, in Sukkot, uh, October of this year, or I guess uh, late September of this year, um, a mini park was opened up. Uh, they call it Mini Israel, and Mini, there's a reason there, miniatures of Israel, uh, miniature sites, buildings. Uh, built to scale. Built to scale that was opened up outside of Latrun. Latrun is on the Tel Aviv Yerushalayim Highway. Um, just before, as you're getting into the mountains, there's this monastery, and uh, it sits over a whole area that's really fairly open, Amek Ayalon, which is a biblical site. Joshua stopped the sun there. Right now, uh, the uh, kibbutz of Shalavim and Nofay Ayalon, which is a residential area, are sitting on the north end of the the valley, there's a lot of agriculture there, and there's the old Latrum Fort, which was a site of at least three battles during uh, the 48 War, which we lost all three. And um, the site was never taken, uh, despite efforts by Haganan, I believe, Rabin. Uh, and um, there's a monastery there. And uh, back in 1986, a 40-ish-year-old uh, Army veteran, uh, he'd been in the Army for 20 years, was retiring, took his wife out for a uh, for a retirement uh, vacation uh, as he got out of the army and went to Europe, went to Holland. And uh, sitting outside of Amsterdam is a mini Europe, a park which has to scale um, Tower of London, Eiffel Tower, all kind of Versailles and pa the great palaces of Europe, um, small little uh, windmills, Dutch windmills. 
and people from Europe uh, flock to this place. It's, 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 it's a site, and people feel proud of the places in their own homeland and want to see it. And this uh, Israeli soldier retiring said, I can do this, it has to be done in Israel. And so he started organizing it. He bought uh, about 30 acres of land outside of Latrun. Um, he and must be very wealthy. Uh, he's got he's got a, uh, a a consortium of investors behind him, mm -hmm. and um, and as well, not only investors, architects, uh, planners, artists. Um, what this they, is desert land. This is really not desert land. It's hot, uh, humid, like Tel Aviv, um, but not desert. It's 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 just between the the coastal plain and as the mountains as you start rising into the mountains at Shara Gaiden. Uh, is just uh, east of there, uh, Tel Aviv to the west, the Trun is right there as the mountains start. Um, they uh, organ laid out a park with, which has in the south an Eilat and in the north a Rosh Hanigran, a Haifa, a Tel Aviv, a Jerusalem in the middle, Beersheba, a Galil in the north, and a Negev in the south. And so in the north, they built themselves a Mount Hermon and, uh, on, along the coast. They've got a whole strip of, of, of water with, with boats, with a, with a Haifa, with the Haifa University rising from the port area, with the Baha'i Gardens rising up the hill, the, the buildings of the university, the colonnaded buildings, uh, Tel Aviv with its boardwalk, uh, the, the, the Shalom center, the, the, the great synagogue of Tel Aviv, all of those buildings, then more inland, well, before you even get inland, in the Galil, Har Tavor, where Tavor and Barak fought uh, the Canaanites, Sisra, uh, with a little mountain there, it's, a, it's forested, I've climbed it with my kids, and uh, there's a little bonsai, the miniature Japanese uh, trees leading up to a monastery on top, which you can climb with your, if you don't want to climb by foot, you can climb by car nowadays, uh, there's uh, Beit Sharim the, the, in the in the Galil, which is the uh, 2,000 almost year old uh, burial site, 1,700 year old burial site of Rabbi Huda Nasi, who was the redactor of the of the Mishnah, uh, who was the Nasi, the the president of the of the country, the leading political as well as religious authority in the land of Israel in the 300s. Um, his burial grounds can be visited today, and um, it's a national park. So they built a little, and the burial grounds very interesting. There's these vaulted uh, uh, caves, burial caves, and the Talmud, the Gemara says in Ksuvah, Staff Kuf Gimel, that Rebbe had said, put a yeshiva where, where students can learn Torah on top of my grave, and you can see carved into the mountains as you go visit. You can see I've, uh, we visited the place in, during the summer, earlier in the summer, uh, before we visited the mini park Israel with its model of this, and you can see carved into the side of the mountain steps, for, for rows of chairs for, for students to sit over the vaulted burial graves and, and, and it's right there on, in the models. Um, in Jerusalem you've got of course the old city walls with uh, the famous Turkish uh, and as walls. I show scenes of this you know as I show scenes of this from the from, from the pictures in the video looking at the miniature people he, they're even set up that they move for example you see people shuffling and praying with prayer books in their hands and, and that's all mechanical, it's all mechanical of miniature and, and miniaturized motorized it's all set on computers so even in uh, Teddy Kolek Stadium which is a soccer stadium you see the people doing the wave <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's just and it, you, you, you go there you see this you, they've got there's the uh, the King David Hotel, across the street from the YMCA, the Supreme Court building, the Knesset building, and you see all this, and you realize people are coming to this because they feel a tremendous pride in the land. I, I have to tell a story. It, it, within the last year, Shlomo Artsy, who's a, who's a pop, pop singer, a, a very famous, for decades, pop singer in Israel, took some friends of his uh, from the up on the Kibbutz, picked them up, by a helicopter which he hired, took them back to the kibbutz so they would all gather together and they're talking with a bunch of 11, 12 year olds from the kibbutz and he picks up a scoop of earth and, he, and Shlomo Arzi is, 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 has very leftist political views but he's a very honest person. He picks up the, ground, the earth and he lets it drop from his hands and he turns to the kids and he goes, kids, is this worth fighting for? Is this worth dying for? 
And the kids turn to him and they go, but it's our only, it's the only country we've got. And the kids realize that what seems to have happened, whatever the backlash was, whatever explains the backlash, the leftist backlash after the 48 and after the 67, where all of a sudden people viewed the land, the country, nationalism with cynicism, all of a sudden you're seeing people building a mini-Israel, which, which shows a love of the land. People wouldn't come there flocking by the thousands if there wasn't such a love in the land, somebody wouldn't invest millions to build such a thing if he didn't expect that people who loved their land wouldn't come to see it. And it's an amazing phenomenon. It's wonderful. Let, let's talk about the other thing, because to see a settlement go up in the desert where there's nothing, and, and where people say there shouldn't be settlements, and so on. Tell us a little bit about this, the settlement that you were, you were speaking of. Okay, the, the, this settlement is on Halukim Mountain. Uh, really hillside, in the Negev, uh, near Steboker. Steboker is the uh, burial grounds, or not just burial grounds, but uh, Ben-Gurion himself lived at, at, at Kibbutz Steboker. And about three kilometers away is this hillside. And four or five years ago... And this is real desert. Oh, uh, real desert. Real, not, not Saudi Arabian Sand. sandy desert, but Israeli Negev desert, arid, uh, semi-arid, hardly any water uh, desert. And... Um, about four or five years ago, Yoske Shapiro, who's a story in himself, and hopefully I'll be able to tell a little bit of it, he's a long-time uh, head of B'nai, Worldwide B'nai Akiva, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, he was on my videotape from, from last year with the Hack Hill uh, as part of that. Um, he was a minister, of, uh, a minister in, in, in the Bayan governments in the early 80s. It, from the early 80s, he set up a Aliyah organization called Tehila, which works in the United States, South Africa, England, uh, Canada. And uh, this uh, organization, as part of this organization, they, they've always been pushing, 20 years ago, they were encouraging Olim to go to al Canal. They've always been pushing and encouraging people to live within the Green Line, over the Green Line. They'll help Olim wherever they want to live, but certainly there was a push for that. Um, decided, well, basically we'll call the left's bluff. They've always been saying, you're always putting up settlements over the Green Line. Oh, the Galil is empty and the Negev is empty. Why don't you go there? So he said, okay, I'll go there. And I'll put up a, a settlement in a Yishuv in the Negev. And what happened was, immediately, Steboker and the other Yishuvim and Kibbutzim in the area said, we don't want those Datiyim. So when the Knesset was... Religious, asked, just, we don't want the religious, 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 not ultra really, but, but uh, Kippot's rule, right. Nid Kippot, modern Orthodox. And they approached the Knesset, when the Knesset was approached for the original licenses, they approached the Knesset, we don't want them there. And it took four or five years to, to finally get it done. And as you'll see on the tape, the cornerstone was finally laid how appropriately on the 28th anniversary of the Yorzeit of the death of the passing of Ben-Gurion last year in November. Um, and it, it was just a beautiful thing. The uh, Several hundred people came out uh, from all over, Renana, Tel Aviv, busloads of people from Yerushalayim, and politicians, obviously Prime Minister Sharon was helicoptered out there uh, a hilltop was flat, and the helicopter landed right there. You had to go through He was sort of the keynote speaker keynote for the him, uh, dedication. And, and dedication. And, and as you can see in the tape, um, the speech by, by, by Sharon was, was an amazing, an amazing t thing. He, he, he said, look, I remember, I'm old enough, I, I remember my conversations with Ben-Gurion, and I remember when setting up a settlement, the Yishuv in this country, if you think of the 30s and the Chalutzim and the Kovat temples and the Chomau, the Migdal, the, the, the towers and, and fences. Of, of, you know, I, he said, I remember when this was a day of happiness and dancing and singing, and look what they've turned it into with cynicism and this, somehow this movement of anti-nationalism and here you have, he says, the Nitki Pult, who have always been leaders in, in, in settlement, are, are, are putting up something that we believe in, a settlement. And he, he said they're the leaders over the Green Line in the Bikal, which is the Jordan Valley. These the are the religious Zionists. The religious Zionists. And, and, it become, and, and if you look on the tape, I think religious Zionists, I think Yoske Shapiro, he himself epitomizes this. I, I just have to talk about his father made Aliyah, from Poland in 1914. His father was a Hasidic Rebbe, came from a long line of Hasidic Rebbe's. If any of your, your viewers have, have, have been familiar with 
Eish HaKodesh, the Holy Fire, uh, which is the Pechechna Rebbe, the last Hasidish Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, who was removed with the rest of the Jews from the ghetto, killed in a, in a labor camp. That's the brother of of the father, well, that's the uncle of Yeska Shapiro. His father was Shaya Shapiro, the Hasidish Rebbe who became known as Harebi Achalutz, because at the age of 50 he went out and started farming the land. Uh, he made Aliyah in 1914 and helped set up Mizrahi and then the whole of Mizrahi in Israel and the Bank Mizrahi in Israel and many of its publications in the 1940s helped fund Kfar Pinas and went out and started uh, working the land and for the last five years, years of his life became a farmer. And uh, he was a friend, colleague, student of Rav Kok, and um, an interesting story. Uh, unbelievable. So, Israel is, is moving ahead. The people are moving ahead. The, the, the nationalism and pride of the, of the people is growing, and uh, I mean, it's real high. There's, there's a future. So, in, in closing, we only have a minute or so left. Uh, tell me... Uh, what, what do you foresee in the, next, in the next year or two? Well, I think right now, I mean, uh, obviously this week uh, government fell, and um, all the polls do say that uh, the right wing is, is, is leading in the polls. And I think that that means that, that, that nationalism, Jewish nationalism, Zionism, has become kosher in people's eyes again. And that's very, very important. And I, and, and I think it's a healthy move for the people. I think if you rocked down, looked at what went on for the last 10 years, there, there was this, yes, the hope for peace. Uh, and, and yet, I, I think that behind it was also a very deep cynicism, as I mentioned before, and, and, and this anti-nationalism, which was not a healthy development. And I think what, what can be looked for for the future, I believe, is, is, is a country which... Uh, is, is, is more stable on its feet, which will take more control, which will not be afraid to say this is not only our country, but we've got to be the ones to police it and rule it and make it a better place for not only Jews, even Arabs, because I think Arabs had it better from 67 to 92 than they had it now, certainly economically and maybe, uh, and, and maybe even politically. Um, and, and I think there's... Deep, very good reason to uh, be optimistic about the, about the upcoming future. Great. Well, I, I want to thank you again. Uh, every time you come to Chicago and every year, we've been privileged to have you on here to share your views of living in Israel and what's going on. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll be able to be back with us again soon to share better news even than you've shared with us today for the optimism of, of the Jewish people and for the land of Israel and maybe even for peace. Um, I want to thank you again, Dr. Larry Hirsch of Beit El Israel. And uh, I want to thank you, all our viewers, for being with us. Remember, we're on every week at this time, so stay tuned each week. And we'll see you next time here on Taped with Everybody, Doug. Shalom. <laughs> So, <laughs> so,